funny about Paris. Do you remember about this? The guy who uh, did a statement on the phone and all the content. But when people can share this with you, um, uh, made it for a thing to you that um, that's what you want to do. You know, 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 Can somebody pull the doors in the back shut so we don't bother people in the hall? Or they bother us. I'm not going to argue about it. Yeah, stand okay. this, the usual connector. Thank you, guys. Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the LISP working group. I'm Luigi. I'm Joel. We are the chairs of, the, of this working group. In the front, we have Damian and Wasim, uh, note taker and secretaries of the working group. You have the note well on the screen. You should be familiar with this note well, which describes what is meant to be a contribution and what is our role here in the IDF. The usual pointers to our chart, charter, the Jabber room, audio stream, and link to the materials page, page with all the presentations of today. Okay. Few updates. Uh, so we have two, two new RFC. These are the EID block space reserved in the IPv6 space, okay? Um, so one is just requesting the block, the other is how to manage the block, okay? RIPEN CC long time ago volunteered to manage this block, so they opened it yesterday, the service, so you have two pointers. One is just the general page of RIPEN CC concerning Lisp, and the second one is uh, the re request form. If you want to play around with the EID space, go to that link, apply, and get your your own block. It's a temporary temporary allocation, I remind you. Okay. Uh, we have still an open position. Damien uh, is stepping down. We didn't take any decision yet about a uh, uh, replacement. So if there is any more volunteer, welcome to show up. And the general status about the documents, we are moving forward pretty well, I think. So we have the the crypto document that is basically done in the RFC queue. Okay, it's just uh, we have a misreference like other documents, but this will go away. Uh, DDT is under discussion. Okay, there are a few discussing the ISG, but outdoors are doing a pretty good job in order to solve the issues. Introduction has been in the RFC queue for a while, still missing a reference. LCAF as well is under discussion um, on the ESG, and you know, is, uh, you want to do a quick update of LCAF? Or? Yeah. Since I couldn't be heard, Dino said the current status is that we're waiting to resolve. We believe we have resolved, but we're waiting for feedback from Stephen Farrell on whether we have sufficiently addressed his comments and concerns. So. Excellent. Another document almost ready, I think. Uh, it's the Lisp sec. Fabio will give uh, right away an update on, on this document. Okay, so we have um, the Lisp type IANA, that's the small document proposed by uh, Mohamed Bokater that about uh, Lisp experimental messages and the registry about message type. Okay, this is went smooth uh, uh, through the working group, so we applied for, we asked it for publication, so it has to go through the normal process in the ITF last call and discussion in the IESG. And then we have 
multicast and young, this will be updated later. Okay. For the agenda, as I said, we have Fabio will give us uh, an update on the security draft, LISPSEC, and then we have Albert, uh, with, uh, which will describe the brand new drafts about uh, 68, 30, and 33 bis. Okay. Lino will give us uh, an update on the uh, uh, LISP uh, geolocation, uh, geo coordinates use case, okay, which is uh, under discussion as a spin-off of the LCAF draft. Then Atma, uh, about uh, problem statement for a common network mapping in infrastructure, okay? Uh, then uh, Tom Herbert uh, accepted to, to come here and give us a, an overview of ILA, so Identify Locator Addressing uh, for IPv6. So I invited him to come here just because uh, his proposal is based on locator ID separation, like LISP. So it makes sense that we are aware of this work and please feel free to help him in his effort, okay? And then Albert hopefully will have five minutes to describe this blockchain mapping system, okay? Any comment on the agenda? I would say no, so thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So this is just a this is Dino. This is Dino. Um, this is just a general comment. Um, I think there was about three or four people that came to me privately and said they wanted to um, present here, but we ran out of time quickly. So I'd like to request to have a two at least a two hour slot next ITF or more. Noted. So. I agree. Fabio? Yeah, yes. Okay. A reminder to Fabio. stand in the pink box. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Okay. So I'm Fabio Maino, and uh, this is the update on uh, um, the NISSEC draft. I haven't published version 12 yet. I did a couple of changes yesterday in the airplane and I couldn't compile offline. So I'll publish it after the meeting. Uh, but you have seen a, a very uh, semi-final version of the draft that I posted to the list uh, maybe two weeks ago. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'll just do uh, going through the most significant changes uh, in, uh, in the draft, thanks to Luigi uh, and a few others that provided uh, uh, some comments. Uh, um, and then since we haven't seen this draft for quite a long time, I think years, um, but it has been you know, very stable and uh, it's implemented and used. Uh, I just give a quick overview, I guess, that while we move forward uh, uh, with the process uh, of uh, reviewing the, 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 the draft, uh, there will be some people that may be new to the group that will look into it, so hopefully this will be uh, helpful. Um, okay, so most significant changes. Uh, um, uh, so uh, on the security consideration section, section six, uh, basically we have added some uh, assumptions uh, on the security of the mapping system itself. So we'll see later uh, when I describe uh, the, the draft that uh, we do uh, assume in the draft that uh, the security of the mapping system itself is outside of the scope of uh, uh, the document. Uh, the scope of the document here, here is to uh, secure the uh, map request, map reply exchange uh, against the attacks that can happen uh, during the process, but considering that the mapping system is uh, uh, secure. This is a, a basic assumption on list of separation between uh, uh, the mapping system itself and the interface to the mapping system. So, uh, you know, this document addresses uh, security of the interfaces and, uh, and of the uh, map request and map reply uh, message. Um, so, there were a few comments about uh, the use of should in the document. So, this is kind of a tough trade-off because uh, in LISP, right, we want to make the mapping available uh, and, of course, we want it to be secure. So, there is sort of a trade-off on uh, how much flexibility you want to allow uh, in the security architecture um, and uh, 
how much you want to make available the mapping uh, uh, itself. So in particular, uh, since there are a few potential configuration uh, in terms of uh, algorithms that are used, uh, like authentication algorithm, key wrapping algorithm, it may happen that uh, the ITR that is sending the map request is uh, asking to use some security function that uh, uh, you know are you know uh, accepted by the ITR itself. Uh, if we consider you know the fact that it is a distributed system and not all the elements uh, of the um, of the uh, overall architecture may support uh, the same algorithm, it is possible, and the protocol is designed so that uh, if for example, the mapping system uh, uh, or uh, uh, the ETR doesn't support the algorithm specified by, uh, by the ITR, um, the, um, uh, they can choose basically the next available algorithm. For example, uh, if uh, the ITR asks for a specific uh, authentication uh, algorithm, they can use another one. Still, is the policy of the ITR that determine if the transfer is acceptable or not. So the protocol is designed in such a way that uh, um, um, the ETR, who is providing the secure data, is doing their best and is providing the answer anyway using uh, whatever algorithm is available. Still, the ITR is uh, responsible to enforce its own policy. And this is a local decision of the ITR, depending on the policy that is configured in the, in the ITR itself. So one can uh, configure the ITR in such a way that has a very strict policy and will accept only the particular algorithms that have been requested. And this may be, you know, okay, and maybe the right thing to do in uh, deployments where we are particularly concerned about security and where we know that the deployment is very uniform and everybody supports uh, those specific algorithms. Uh, still, uh, the ITR could, be, could uh, implement a loose policy and can say, okay, so if I asked, uh, uh, SHA-256 and uh, uh, the ITR came back only with SHA-128, that might still be okay with me and I still decide to accept that uh, uh, reply. But this is a local decision. So the protocol leaves the flexibility to the local policy and uh, uh, this is reflected by the use of the word should uh, across the document. So you will see a lot of should in, uh, uh, in the document that says what the ITR should do if he receives, for example, uh, a, a, a reply with, uh, uh, with an acronym that is different from what is suggested. Of course, this could be exploited by attackers, right? Because if I, uh, for example, uh, reply with a weaker uh, ash uh, function, uh, that may be a vector for, for attack. But that's what exactly what RFC uh, 2119 says, right? It says, so the use of what should is meant to uh, uh, recommend, let me read the word so I don't, I don't invent it, right? Um, so, um, if the, uh, what is specified with should is not done by the implementer or by the deployer, it's important that the security implication that are associated with that choice are well understood in terms of the threat model, right? So this is why you will see uh, should uh, across, of, uh, uh, across of the document. And so, uh, we have added in the security section a paragraph where we uh, reaffirm uh, basically what is said in uh, RFC 2119 and we suggest a couple of examples where we say that, for example, there are some deployments where um, the key uh, that is transported between the ITR and the mapping system, um, it may be acceptable to not encrypt that key. So the recommendation is still should. So. Uh, the implementers and the, the deployer should uh, do that encryption, but there are particular use cases where it might be acceptable to not encrypt that key. And the same uh, for the HMAC uh, algorithms, the example that I just described before. So when you go through the document, uh, you know, keep in mind uh, this consideration. Uh, and then we have uh, done, redone basically section seven that is now compliant to RC 5226. Uh, uh, asking for uh, those registry to be created, assigning initial value and specifying policies uh, uh, to allocate further values. Uh, typically, uh, the policy suggested are that uh, a specification is required. So that's uh, another uh, draft uh, uh, or NDRC uh, will be required to allocate uh, uh, more value. Okay?
So these are basically the changes. As I said, I'll publish it uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, but uh, I posted to the list uh, a version that was almost uh, uh, the same uh, that, uh, uh, that will be published as version 12. And uh, the other five minutes that are left, uh, I give a quick description of uh, LeafSec. Uh, so some of you have already seen this slide a few years ago. Uh, if you have a good memory, just, you know, uh, bear with me. Uh, if not, this is a, a chance to refresh it. So what is the scope of uh, LeafSec? Basically protecting the map request, map reply exchange, right? We want to provide original authentication, anti-reply and integrity protection to the map request, map reply uh, protocol. Uh, another important goal, uh, security goal, is uh, protecting uh, from overclaiming uh, uh, attack. Basically, uh, the um, ETR, can overclaim prefixes uh, that are not uh, uh, assigned to the ETR itself. So uh, LeafSec as a mechanism with which the mapping system is basically um, restricting the uh, uh, authoritativeness of the ETR to the prefixes that have been assigned to it. So the ITR can receive uh, a map reply and can verify if the uh, uh, ETR has uh, overclaimed some of the prefixes. Uh, this is a um, this is a simple uh, example of the operation and how this sec works. So the components here are uh, okay. Here are the ITR on the right hand side. Here uh, the mapping system, uh, map resolver on one side, map server on the other side and the ETR here. There are two sites, and uh, there is a packet that is trying to be encapsulated and sent. Uh, so there, there is a map request that is trying to be uh, resolved and sent to the mapping system, and uh, the corresponding map reply will come through the uh, map server and, uh, um, and the ETR. So these little evil uh, faces are the threat model, basically. So. Uh, the threat model includes attack that can happen uh, um, on the ITR map resolver uh, path, map server ETR, and ETR ITR. And uh, as we said, we assume that the mapping system is secure. This is a reasonable assumption because the mapping system uh, that is, you know, interchangeable and uh, could be a DDP, a, a, an ALT, or whatever uh, funny mapping system one can come up with, uh, will have its own security mechanism. Uh, uh, yeah. For example, if one were to use ALT, uh, it would use uh, pro most likely uh, uh, IPsec uh, um, to protect the communication between the map resolver and the map server. That, uh, it's a reasonable assumption. Or if the mapping system is not distributed, then you know uh, this is the same system. So uh, we, we the, the, the security is provided uh, by the physical security of the mapping system uh, itself. So. Uh, Okay, this was the first model. Uh, I went through this. Let's go to the uh, to the packet. So the basic um, mechanism that is uh, uh, um, at the base of the security of this sec is the use of what we call one-time key. It's basically a one-time key, a key that uh, the ITR generates randomly and uses exactly one time. And uh, this key is securely transported to the map resolver, to the map server, and then is used by the map server to uh, authenticate the, uh, um, um, the message that is sent to the ETR. Uh, also, the map server does an important function that is uh, derived uh, uh, with a key derivation function, uh, another one-time key uh, um, uh, that uh, is passed down to the ETR. So in this way, the map server can sign the content of the mapping that is handed over to the ETR, but the ETR doesn't know which key was used because the result of this key derivation function is a function that uh, is a key that cannot be inverted, right, and cannot be brought back to the to the original OTK. So in this way, the ETR can add uh, an additional signature that is the blue part here that is uh, basically uh, providing the authentication and the integrity of the remaining part of the map reply, but uh, he won't be able to change and then to overclaim his own mapping because uh, 
the uh, map server has used a key that the ETR cannot access to. Both those keys as the, are derived by the same one-time key. So when the ITR receives back the map reply, it will be able to verify the integrity and the original authentication of uh, uh, both the part that is signed by the mapping server, by the map server, and both the part that is signed by the by the ETR. And that is basically the mechanism with which we prevent uh, um, uh, overclaiming uh, attacks. Because if the ETR tries to do something uh, nasty here with a blue part, we still have the red part that is signed by the mapping server. Um, of course, the security of the mechanism relies on transporting the one-time key in a secure way. And there is a mechanism that is uh, based on the, the use of AES wrap keys uh, that uh, will allow to encrypt the one-time key from the ITR to the map resolver and then from the map server to the ETR. The one-time key is no longer included in the packet uh, uh, in the final map reply. So we don't need to carry the map reply to the destination, but the, the key is just stored uh, at, the, at the ITR. Uh, itself. Um, and this is what I was referring to, right? Uh, when we deploy IPsec, if we consider the full threat model with all the devilish uh, little faces there, uh, we will uh, have to use AES wrap key here. We will have to um, uh, use also AES wrap key here, use, you know, the appropriate, the, the strongest uh, uh, hash function that are recommended by the, uh, by the ITR down here. Still, uh, you know, it is flexible. So if uh, we give careful consideration to the threats that may be uh, not present in a particular deployment, it is possible uh, to use a policy in the, at the ITR that allows for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, use of different uh, uh, policies. Again, this is based on the local ITR policy. So it's uh, in, in the ITR's hand. If it wants a strict policy, it can implement it. If it doesn't want it, it, it won't. Go to the microphone, Dino. <laughs> could you just, this is Dino, could you just make a mention how the AS wrap key is distributed? Yeah, um, so typically map uh, resolver and ITR and the map server and ETR, they share, they have a pre-share key that they use for the map registration. Basically to indicate that the map registration uh, um, is, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, is authenticated. So we can use the same key, and that is uh, what m main implementation is done. Uh, the distribution of the key itself is out of the scope of the draft itself. So this is sort of a suggestion saying if uh, uh, ETR and ITR are co-located, uh, they already have uh, a key that is used for map registration, so, uh, and it's a key, an authentication key, so this is doing exactly uh, the function, so it may make sense to use the same key. I see a problem. The um, ITR, which is ETR functionality, is co-located, registers to its own map server. Right. But this map request is being sent to a map server for the destination it's querying. So, so what do you say? Uh, the, the, this ITR is sending a map request to a map server it has no relationship with. So okay. how could it share a key? Yeah, that's fine, but they are no, it can't use right? the, I'm saying it can't use the registration key because it's not registering to it. Yeah, yeah, but oh. note that, you know, uh, the key that is shared between the ITR and the map resolver is one key, and the key that oh, is a, a different key. It's a key prime, right? So they can be different. They don't have to be the same. If ETR oh, and a, the ITR are because there's a K prime there and a K over there. Yeah, exactly. That's right. The prime is small and any other questions? Okay, how close do you think you guys are to be requesting working group last call on this? You are the author. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I think we are. Yeah, yeah, I think we are. I have addressed all the comments that uh, uh, Luigi brought up. Uh, there were a few more. So I think we are ready. And, you know, as I say, the document has not been changed in maybe four years or something like that. So it has been out there for quite a while. And we have implementations, both open source and uh, closed source. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's very close. And I would ask, you know, if the working group wants to. Uh, okay, so if you think it's done, then when you get the next version up, Send a notice to the list requesting that, and we as chairs will okay. move it forward. Cool. Thank you. Next talk. That would be uh, Albert. Albert talking about uh, 6830 and 6833 revisions.
No, doesn't work the, with PDFs, doesn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so, um, <clears throat> hello, I will present our work on uh, 6830 and 6833B. So next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of the scope of what we are doing. So uh, according to the list charter, we are uh, we must uh, work on a high priority item, which is uh, develop a standard track solution based on the experimental RFCs that we already have. So next slide. And we are chartered to do so in April 2017, which means that submit two documents, 6830B, which is based on the data plane, and 6833B, which is based on the control plane. So next slide, please. So what we did is we submitted two documents, uh, which at the moment are individual submissions, uh, which are 6830Bs and 6833Bs, so data and control plane. So and now I will explain what we have done to each of those documents. And first of all, it's the data plane. So next slide. So if you take 6830, RFC 6830, and you take all the sections that are there, this is pretty much like a summary, a table of contents. And next slide. This is how we have uh, initially divided the contents between data and control plane. So pretty much everything is on the data plane, except items in red, which goes to the control plane, which at the end are the control plane messages, which is map request, map reply, map register, and map notify. And everything else is pretty much on the data plane. So next slide. Now I'm going to discuss, uh, not in, it's not a complete list, but just to give you an idea on what, how we have changed the document. So at the introduction, we have removed everything related to the, um, the four free zone scalability issue. Uh, and now I will say that the introduction is quite neutral. It's just specifying this is a data plane and this is how it works. That's it. Then on the overview, we have added a reference to LCAF because uh, before we assumed that an EID was an IP address. Now we are saying uh, typically an EID is an IP address, but can be many other things. And we have also specified that the data plane can work with the control plane. Then on the, on the encapsulation section, which is the where the real meat is, where you can see the encapsulation, we have uh, uh, added the KK bits from List Crypto, which I believe carry the, um, the, uh, uh, an ID of the key that is used for data plane encryption. Then we have added a new section, which is the List Map Catch, that does not specify anything but describes the relation between 6830 and 6833 bits. This was Damien's idea to say, okay, these, these data plane forwards packets or encapsulate packets according to what's written on the map cache. How you populate the map cache is up to you. A way to do so is 6833 bits. Then we fixed a typo on MTU handling, which I believe was raised by Joel some time ago. It was a very simple type on an equation, so next slide. Then as for the consideration section, so we we reduced the length of the multicast section and add a reference to single free. Then mobility consideration is also shorter, but it's pretty much same content. Then deployment considerations, we have added a discussion on uh, the cache. So at the end, in, in, the, in the data plane, you cache information on how to encapsulate packets. Now, depending on how you deploy ITRs, ETRs, or RTRs, you will have to face certain challenges, and this is what we have written there. Then security considerations, it's, I don't really know, I would like to hear about the working group on what to write, because uh, if you read what it's on 6830, it's, it's, uh, I will say it has been, so on that time we didn't have the threat analysis, now we have the threat analysis, and maybe I suggest just to cite the threat analysis, which is a document that specifies all the threads on, on, on that protocol. But I don't know if that's right or not. So I will hear your feedback. And then we have removed all the open issues. So next slide, please. So now with the control plane. So I will do the same, but with the control plane. So this was initially the map server interface. And we have changed this document. So next slide. So what we have done is, first of all, we have changed the title to Locator ID Separation Protocol Control Plane, which is pretty much describing what it is. And on the third item, you can see the main change, which is we have added the message that we have removed from 6830. We have added them here, which is map request, map reply, map register, and map notify. 
Then on addition, we have changed the introduction, and we have, now we mentioned that this is a control plane that uh, can work with, with the list data plane, uh, but can work with other data planes, which I think is an important uh, method. Um, and then there are a bunch of small changes. Uh, we, ha we now explain that there are do uh, nodes in the control plane that can that mm, that cannot. So not all the nodes on the control plane are uh, MR or MS or MS. They can be all nodes or DT nodes. Then we have updated certain bits on the control plane message, particularly map register, I believe, with bits that they didn't make make it into 6830, but are either vendor specific or open source specific so next slide we have also included how to operate the map referral on a map resolver for ddt we have removed an open issue about the additional state required by map servers which is addressed by ddt and we add a reference to list threat analysis on the security section so next slide uh, so that's all any comment Uh, Fabio Maino. Um, so yeah, on this on the security threat, I think uh, on the security reference, I think it's a good idea, right? Uh, Leaf threat is an RFC now, so uh, or will be or whatever it is, but uh, so that could be a good reference, I think, to add uh, uh, to add here. Um, on the control plane, um, so I'm sorry, I didn't have the chance to go through the document, but um, I suspect that. Um, it's very nice that you have added the section where you say that this can work with different data planes. Uh, there are, of course, some mechanisms that are specific of the data plane of 6830, uh, right? Uh, so, uh, but that's fine. I think uh, the two go as a pair. And uh, in future, let's say, I don't know, VIX and GPE wanted to uh, specify a control plane, it would make sense to reference to the control plane RFC uh, and, uh, you know, say, basically incrementally what are the differences right and say for example uh, i don't know there are no security beat or this or maybe there is a protocol type or whatever so i think it makes very much sense and I, i'm not saying that uh, i'm gonna write that back but <laughs> i'm just saying that that could be really yeah fabio this is dino that was our intent is to have a control plane that other data plane documents could reference and then those data plane documents would um, reference um, what they do in the data plane and what they do for OAM type functions and security type functions. So that's their data plane specific stuff. And if they want to use map requests and map replies for our, for OAM, they could do that as well. But they they have to specify how they use it, and because it, it could be different than the way the list data plane does it. And, and this is precisely what's written on the new list map catch section, more or less, which is how this data plane can use the list control plane. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Um, Pat Mel, I have a question. Uh, what is the track that you are proposing for those two documents? I hope those are standard tracks. That's the point of the work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, Albert. Dino. Dino. Ah, uh, yes, you have to use your stuff, right? No, that one no, 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 it's not this one. It's this one. I have okay. to use that one. I don't know what that cord is. That cord is only no, for no. me don't, 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 don't mess this with me. Uh, we do not platform. mess with me. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk about the, um, the agenda said dash 01, but we got dash 02 out. So I'm going to describe the changes. It should be very quick. Um, basically, um, in April of this year, we put out the dash 00 um, of this geo spec. I'll talk about what it is. Uh, dash 01 um, was added in October. Uh, we wanted to specify how altitude was an optional field and how um, to clarify geocoordinates LCAF type when it's encoded inside an instance ID. And now in um, later in October, right before here, we added changes to be um, 
have a new consistent format with the IGPs. I'll show you that in a second. There it is. So um, dash zero zero basically um, added to what was documented in the LCAP, but added the radius so we could have a geo prefix. A geo prefix is defined as a point and a radius, so you can build a geofence sphere. So you can register that as a um, EID record or return it in an RLOC record when you do an, uh, a lookup. Um, the authors of OSPF, ISD, ISP, GP, um, are also doing the same sort of thing. So the format on the right is what we decided on, and now we're all four of us are consistent with the same format. Uh, what was interesting that was added is they took radius. It's now a con contiguous field rather than being split up to be compatible the old way. But those bits you see up there allow granularity. So we could do um, um, altitude in meters or kilometers. We could do radius in meters, kilometers. Um, actually, centimeters is granularity because the IGP guys have uh, they want to look at two topper X switch or two one RU switches, and they want to be able to geolocate this one versus that one. So they need centimeter granularity. They also have an uncertainty that they thought they needed to use, which list doesn't have a use for right now. Where if you um, there's a kind of a margin of error where you think something is located, um, sometimes you want it to be larger to have coarsification, so um, there's privacy protection. Um, then the other change that went in is the IG, the ISG commented on the uh, LTREF draft to spec out privacy protection. Wherever you um, store or transmit geo coordinates, you have to make sure that there's, the, 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 there's privacy protection. Um, so what we told them is that we would make a reference to PCP-160 in the LCAP document and that the use case document that uses the geo coordinates would say more, and that's this document. This is the use case document that uses geo coordinates. Okay, so we basically um, say that we spec out where geo coordinates are stored in the list network elements, where they're protected, and how they're uh, returned. And, and a lot of policy needs to be um, specified to say who gets what. PCP 160 is RFC 6280, that basically um, is privacy considerations when you use GPS coordinates. So it's, there, it's a big, long draft that is super paranoid about things, right, for legitimate reasons. Okay, so real quick, I just I did an implementation of this. Um, this is basically showing in a map server um, a site that's being registered to the map server in instance ID 1000. Basically what it's saying is that there's these distinguished names that are used as EID records. So there's um, San Jose, New York, Paris, London. Tokyo, and then SJC is the airport code for San Jose, which is a geo point, and CDG is the airport code for Paris, and that's a geo point. Okay. So what when what you do is you have this geo prefix that maps to representation. Um, the slash 100 means um, that's uh, 100 kilometers from that point creates the geo prefix. Quick question, given that you said we don't have any use for uncertainty, isn't that a perfect example of where you want uncertainty? If you're really saying it's somewhere in the airport, then you pick the middle of the airport and you specify the uncertainty as the size of the airport, and it seems like even our use cases, we could actually use the uncertainty. Yeah, I think the, and so the IGP guys aren't using a geo prefix or a geo fence. They're just using a point. And they're saying, I think Joel is somewhere in Seoul, but we don't know exactly where he is. And the margin of error is the geographical boundary of Seoul. So that's what they're thinking, I believe. OK. So encoding a geo point is just basically the geo coordinates without the radius specified. There's no slash 100 there. So that's how it's encoded. So here's an example of what you can do is you can actually look up the EID CDG in the mapping database and also look up the geo um, prefix called Paris and you can find out if CDG is in Paris. So you do the lookup and this shows the implementation where the lookup is from the CDG and the geo point. The geo prefix, the Paris is looked up in terms of the prefix and then you have to see the order decision that um, CDG is 23 kilometers from the center of that, that um, geosphere point. So these are things that you can do. This is all a control plane play. You don't do anything with data. But you can use these sort of things to find out which ETR should I encapsulate to 
because maybe an ETR has closer signal range to an EID than another one. So you can do r -log selection based on this information with multiple lookups. Oops. That's it. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. George Garagian is from, from Huawei. Are you assuming that the uh, areas are not overlapping? The what's not overlapping? The areas. So you have um, uh, the, the point and then with the, with a the range, uh, and then you store it uh, in the right. database. Why are you assuming that these uh, areas that are stored in the database are not overlapping? Well, we've been doing a lot of research on this, and you could certainly have multiple geo prefixes that overlap in geographical space. The question is, is when you do a lookup, do you pick one or both? And yeah. what we're, what, what's future work on this draft is, is how do you do a longest match lookup or an all geo prefix lookup? Because if there's these, let's say we have three geo prefix that all overlap and you're actually at the intersection of all three, when you look up that point CDJ, can you return back all? Yeah. And that's kind of a walk of the database because um, geo prefixes aren't in power of two um, address blocks or, or encoding blocks like, um, like IP addresses are. So you can't use um, efficient data structures to look it up. You have to kind of do a walk. So that's for further research. That we're, we're, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. If anybody wants to help work on that, I would love to uh, collaborate. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dino. Thank you. Next. Hi, um, this is Padma I'm from Huawei, and today I'm presenting uh, the ideas problem statement draft on behalf of my co-authors. So, what is IDEAS? So, it stands for ID Enabled Networks, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. It's a new mailing list that was created back in uh, August, and um, we would like to use this alias to discuss all kind of common problems in common infrastructure on the control plane for all ID protocols. Uh, but let's look a little bit about the ideas and what problem statement and why now and why in LISP. Um, over the 10 last years, the landscape of the internet has changed enormously. Uh, in 2014, actually, we ended up with for the first time, more mobile users than fixed users. And unsurprisingly, the mobile data traffic actually exceeded as well the fixed, um, fixed network. What we're looking at is that not only the usage of the internet is changing, but how people are using it is changing and what kind of new applications are coming in. And when we look at all this, and we look at 10 years ago when we were discussing about ID protocols, we were really concerned about the growth of the routing table. But now, most of the new requirements are mobility and security. And with 5G coming up, we're looking at a great opportunity for ID protocols who are very good candidates to solve a number of problems. One of them is session continuity on mobility and all types of mobility, whether it's cellular mobility or IP mobility. Um, reachability of IoT devices, um, that has been something that has been discussed quite a bit of giving them IDs. Not all of them are on the IP, but how do you reach them and how do you find them? Heterogeneous network access is another one that's coming out a lot with 5G. How do we actually have those mixed uh, of different technologies and be able to reach them. Now, let's look at ID protocols. All this looks nice on paper, but let's look at what we have today. Um, we do have ID protocols, but they are mostly deployed in the DC world or SD1. None of them are global. And to be able to have a large case use of any kind of ID protocols across multiple administrative domains, we will need to have some kind of global mapping system or some kind of, of mapping system which is accessible to all. But 
Sure, now that we know and we say we need this global mapping system, what are the problems that we're going to see when we start doing that? And why do we need it? Now, we have multiple ID solutions. And if each one of them decided to go global, they're going to fail, most likely, because it's going to be impossible and impractical to get each one of them a separate mapping system, unless we have one mapping system that everybody can tap into. So it really makes sense to have some standardization on the control plane level, some standardization of how to accept those mapping systems. The component infrastructure will facilitate that and definitely will remove any impediment on and complexity for deployment as well. Last, we're thinking about new breeds of idea-aware applications. And these idea-aware applications could actually also use that. Any new types of protocols or any kind of new idea-aware services might be able to use that mapping system and deploy much faster. Of course, what we once we say all this, we know that we'll need a flexible, open, and extensible and efficient interface. Today, there's no standard um, how to access this mapping system. And that's great that now we have the BIS, which actually talks about having multiple data plane actually being able to access this. But we also want the mapping system today. The way we use the mapping system is really basically uh, an ID and an address. But how about making this a little bit more smarter and we can actually enhance and have plenty of new functionalities for that. And um, we have loads of example of lack of interoperability. And now is the time to rethink it because now it's not as much deployed. And let's try and get it right since the beginning. So I've given a few examples here. Um, interestingly, I think uh, we went into the routing area working group. There was people talking about the lack of control plane, uh, common control plane for uh, SD1. We've seen this all over the place. Another aspect that we also want to tackle is how do we use those IDs? Who allocates them? What is the format? What is the best way of doing this? Because if we start thinking about multiple ID protocols communicating with each other, then that also means that there is some kind of agreement of how we are going to allocate those IDs. Um, I know we have the IPv6, which is very big, and everybody says there's enough space for everyone. But still, we need to have some kind of agreement. Because today, what's happening is that if we do not have this agreement, we're going to have siloed communications. And there's going to be impossible to actually have a backward compatibility is going to be an operational nightmare. Confidentiality is something that's coming up really big. Because once you have, you give an open access, that means that everybody knows who you are, where you are, and that might not be the right thing. There's also, we've been talking about security, and actually it's great, Fabio, that we're talking about the security of the mapping system, because this is really where I am more concentrating on, is if we have a widely deployed mapping system, that means across multiple administrative domains, how do we do that? Because now you don't control everything. And um, one thing that we would like to add in this mapping system is information for industrial internet. For example, with so much of IoT coming online, we're talking about billions of it by 2025, it's going to be impossible to manually actually um, provision for them. And we're looking more and more about machine-to-machine -machine communication, which means that zero-touch provisioning is going to be a reality. And the mapping system might be a good place to actually put all these kind of new functionalities. Okay. 
we're talking about the mapping responsibility. Who is responsible and where? Because that's one of the biggest problems with when we start talking about mapping, universal mapping system or global mapping system. And um, we would like to give some thought to it, but there should be regional per AS um, who ideally should be the owner of the ID who actually updates it. Um, how do we distribute it? What is the redundancy? No single point of failure, of course. Uh, how do we make a collection of NMS collaborating with each other? These are things that we really need to think of as we go forward. Massively scalable is something, another problem that we have to think carefully. Um, we're talking about unprecedented scale. Each time I come up with this speech, a lot of people ask me the same question, why not use DNS? No, we cannot use DNS because DNS will not give you the kind of flexibility that we're looking, will not give you the kind of scale we're looking, will not be able to reach the kind of latency we're looking. Excuse me, uh, as a participant, not speaking as chair, but having worked on other systems that use DNS, that is a very strong statement which people who work on DNS would very strongly disagree with. So I don't want to leave the, ro the room with the impression that that is agreed IETF fact. I can accept that you view it that way, but a lot of people consider that DNS is indeed a viable solution as an alternative. I'm not saying it's the one we should use. I'm not at all sure we can agree on one we should use, but asserting that DNS does not scale well enough or does not have the dynamics that's needed, other folks have done experiments and demonstrations that show different answers. So please be a little careful about that level of assertion. Okay, yeah, I'll be careful. But, you know, this is basically, depending on my own opinion, that this is uh, engaged the working group. But I do feel that we would like to have more extension the way we're going forward. And it, at least it's worthwhile to actually have some thought on it. Um, it doesn't hurt to actually think about it. <laughs> So security, um, the secured access is actually secure access to the mapping system itself. Um, what are we going to, how we're going to actually implement confidentiality policy, flexibility for future apps. Are we going to add metadata there and how we're going to do this? Um, I think that makes it very powerful to have metadata that can actually give us um, ID context awareness, for example. And if we can make a smart mapping system, um, and maybe really that's why I, I tend to feel like, you know, we're making things beyond what DNS does today. Uh, maybe one, one way would be to extend it, I don't know, but trying to be a little bit ahead of that and actually try to see. Um, Today, DNS is an open system, and we know very well that, you know, about three weeks ago, and tonight there's the technical priority discussing about the DDoS attack, trying to find out systems that actually can prevent this from happening. Can we use maybe machine learning or other uh, ways of looking at data analytics to prevent this from happening? Now, tomorrow, uh, I'd like to invite everyone, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 6 to 7.30, we have the very first meeting, uh, kickoff meeting for ideas. And uh, please subscribe to the alias if you want to have more information about this. And um, the areas, it is still very, very new, so we're not exactly sure how this is going to go forward. But um, we would like to have discussions. And uh, here's the agenda for tomorrow, and um, I hope that, you know, you guys can make it. What's next? Um, why here? LIST is one of the places where has the most expertise on ID protocols, and this is the right place to discuss about this, especially if we try to look at ID protocols in general. There are several areas that we feel that um, there's areas for work, um, allocation and format of ID, for example, on what that should be based. Can we leverage ID in direction for more security features, for example? 
And uh, we have one plea, I have one plea, is to have more people try to de deploy those mapping systems and actually have more data, operational data, and actually share them. I think that would be uh, very useful for the rest of us. And uh, we would like to be able to eventually talk about interoperation and best practices as well. Okay, that's it. So, Padma, this is Dino. Regarding security, um, you stated um, that the data that's being moved around for LISP purposes is secured, and securing the network elements, authorizing, providing confidentiality, all that stuff is important. But I, and you said it, but you didn't put it in the requirement section that um, we need to have the mapping system be DDoS protected. Yeah. And so I think that's a requirement that should be explicitly um, as a line item. Yes, okay, yeah. Other One other question. Yeah. You're talking about an internet-wide mapping system, right? We've talked about that. I understand it, I'd love to see it. Is your work, does your work include the issues of deployment incentives? Yes, actually we would like to do that as well because obviously I, I think it's one thing to talk about it and it's one thing to actually deploy it. Yes. And uh, this is one of the reasons where I put the areas routing and ops because I think that the two go together and it's impossible to actually persuade people to do this unless you actually show them and give them some best practice of how to do that. Definitely. Still on the mapping system, uh, I don't think you really need to, or maybe you have to think not to target a one global mapping system. Um, I know Mohamed Bougader and Stefano Sech in France were, were, uh, are working on um, having different instances of mapping system and be able to BGP to inject prefix from one mapping system to the other. Now, the nice thing, they are have a demo using two instances of DDT, but in principle, it could be anything. You just decide what you want to inject and share. So you, just to say that you don't need one global entity, but the capacity to share information. Yeah, so let me, let me make a correction here. When we're talking about the global mapping system, that doesn't mean there is one only and it's one location. It is a collection of network mapping system. There might be private instances that actually talk to others. You don't need necessarily to disclose everything. Okay, that's Any other question? Feedback? So you have the, 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 the reference where to go uh, tomorrow yeah. afternoon. For the discussions tomorrow. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pat. Tom. Hi, um, my name is Tom Herbert. Uh, thanks for having me today. I'm going to talk a bit about identifier locator addressing. Um, as was mentioned before, this is um, another instance of identifier locator split uh, that we've been working on. Okay. So identifier locator split is splitting basically an IP address into a locator portion, identifier portion. portion. And unlike LISP and I guess some other efforts, uh, this does not require encapsulation. So we're modifying the addresses in the packet, very similar to how ILMP does it. The concept is that the application sees what we call a SIR address. This is something like a, a representation of an identifier. And when the packet is sent, somewhere along the path, the SIR address is transformed into an actual locator address, which indicates the actual location of the entity that's being addressed. So that's kind of, a, in a nutshell, the, the order. So there's a lookup function to begin with sending a packet. We overwrite the part of the address with a locator. And in order to avoid any issues with the protocol checksums, transport protocol checksums, since we're changing the address covered by pseudo header, we use a checksum neutral mapping, um, which is just um, defined in some of the uh, six or four or six translation. Next slide. 
So a little more about the address split. So like ILMP, we split it right down the middle. So this is a 64-bit locator, 64-bit identifier. The locator is routable, as um, I guess in list. But the important thing is it's not used in the connection endpoint. The identifier is low-order low 64 bits that is um, not routable except to something in the network that can translate it to an actual locator. But this is used as the connection endpoint. And we have a, a type field that allows a few different uh, combinations of locators. Some of these support virtualization. Some support embedding IPv4 addresses and IPv6 and what have you. So here's an example of the flow in ILA. So on the left, we have a source host sending to quad 3.1. Um, they might get this out of DNS, so this uh, somehow this address uh, is the address used by host application. So in this case, the host will send this, and this packet will actually go on, out on the wire uh, with that address. Now, the, the quad 3 portion of this actually routes the packet to an ILA router somewhere in the network, and the function of an ILA router is to receive these untranslated packets with SIR addresses and then translate them into actual locator addresses for forwarding to the destination. So in this case, the ILA router translates the quad 3.1 address to quad 2.1.1, and the, the quad 2.1 is the network prefix for the host destination. So the packet goes from two, or along the path of two, to the destination. Now the destination, we need to do the reverse translation in order to get back to the original address. So the destination will recognize the quad two colon one as its locator, and it will rewrite the, the address in the packet back to the quad three colon colon one, and that's what the application actually sees. So from the application's perspective, all it sees are these SIR um, addresses, which are kind of globally visible. It's only on the network that the actual locator addresses are used. Now, in addition to the router, if you notice here, we have some, something of a triangular routing situation. So in order to resolve that, we allow the possibility that the router can basically send back a redirect. And if the source host supports ILA, it can actually ca cache this information and do the translation itself on the next packet. So that's what four shows. So after the redirect occurs, source host modifies its cache. So now it maps um, the 333 colon colon one to go to 222 colon one colon colon one. And that's now the new um, destination address, locator address. So it can send directly to the destination. One important uh, thing we did in ILA was a checksum neutral mapping. And again, because we're changing the destination address in IPv6 packet, we are potentially changing the transport layer checksum, TCP or UDP, in the packet. And to, to prevent having to go and do a deep packet inspection and find the TCP header, UDP header, and, and update the checksum manually, what we do is uh, borrow this trick of a checksum neutral mapping. And the idea is, when we make one change to part of the packet that's affected by the checksum, we can offset that with another change in a different part of the packet that's covered by the same checksum. So in ILA, we actually use the low order bits of the identifier as a 16-bit checksum offset value or checksum adjust value. And there's a little bit of a calculation, but basically since we know the old um, locator bits and the new locator bits, we have to account for the difference in the checksum in order to have basically a, a null or, or zero, zero checksum difference. So that's kind of what the, the calculation is here. Now when we do this, we actually set a bit in the address so that the receiver knows to undo the translation. And to do that, does it does need to know both the old uh, SIR address and the locator. But it should know that anyway, so it actually works out pretty well. Next slide. So ILA is intended for a variety of use cases. At Facebook right now, we're deploying this as a data center virtual um, task virtualization. The idea is every task in the data center will have its own IP address. 
And ILA gives us the ability to make these tasks mobile so we can move them around. Their identifier and server address never changes, that's persistent. However, the locator changes when they move from machine to machine. And presuming we have the infrastructure to support updating all the mappings, the idea is that even with this task mobility, we'll still have reachability and uh, mobility basically become seamless. We're also looking um, kind of Just the broader- Just a question on that. In your earlier message exchanges, I didn't see any way for the source to learn that, that a 222 address that it had been given had changed. So how does it, to complete the picture, how do you get updates back to communicating parties when you move things? So we have some ideas on that. Uh, one idea is to basically do a type of host unreachable. So if we send a packet to the old destination, that old destination should know that no longer um, is the right place. So it could send back a type of, of redirect or um, at least a host unreachable. And then the initiating host would cancel out its um, cache entry and then just re renegotiate that. There's also some opportunities here. We can do push models. If we know who the participants are in a, um, in a communication, we can actually push the information. Depends on um, of the scale of this. So if we have a couple hundred hosts, we, we can assume every host has all the information, so it becomes easy. A few million, then we start to get into more of the, uh, we need some network protocols to kind of supplement things. So data center virtualization is uh, kind of a broader concept where we can think of what if we start giving addresses, IPv6 addresses to things even finer granularity than task um, content, individual devices, uh, you potentially could even give every disk block uh, an, an IP address. So I think um, that's kind of what one of the things Padma, Padma was uh, referring to. When we get to this really large uh, use of IPv6 addresses, then the control plane and the scaling starts to become quite interesting. So there actually is some, some work along these lines in terms of kind of the content addressing, which is pretty promising. We can also use it for a more canonical multi-tenant virtualization. There are modes in ILA that allow embedding uh, an IP address, virtual IP address, and a virtual networking identifier. And 5G mobility is also kind of a promising use case. In this use case, it's similar to task in that we have a migration component, but instead of task being migrated, it's actually the whole device is being migrated from, say, base station to base station and a cellular network. So those are kind of the main use cases we we're considering. If you look at the middle column, it's the scaling. And within the data center, scale is, is right now Tasks are actually fairly small scale, relatively speaking, at a few millions. But once we start getting into the finer grain addressing, that scale goes up. Uh, Multi-tenant virtualization that we have today, similar issue. Right now, scaling is probably in the few millions. Um, but once we start doing, say, addressing within virtual networks and within virtual devices, then that scale would go up too. And then mobility or 5G mobility will have a similar pattern, we're assuming, and that scale right now could be in um, few mil, hundred million maybe, but um, like 5G guys are expecting this to go to the many billions, so we need to anticipate that scale. One of the other important considerations though is obviously within mobility, what's the rate of change? How many of these mapping updates do we need to do? Um, that would determine a lot on the load of the network and how many, say, ILA routers we need. So that's a little harder to, to predict, um, but we're assuming at some point this would be millions per second in a rather large network. And then we can do the reverse calculation, figure out how many um, operations per device, uh, say a, a device that's responding with mapping uh, requ resolution requests, how many devices will we need based on the expected load. So all of that will have to be kind of um, built in or designed into actual deployment consideration. Okay. So the advantages of ILA, um, and I guess uh, I'll, I'll slant this a little bit towards some of the advantages uh, versus LISP as, as opposed to some other um, other implementation or solutions. So first of all, ILA is not encapsulation, as I mentioned. So there is zero overhead on the wire to use ILA, it's not encapsulation. Uh, this is important for two reasons. One is obviously it saves 
overhead on the network. Um, so zero bytes is good. But the other thing, then this is probably really important in the data center, is when, we send, when we're sending packets in ILA, if we're sending a TCP packet, for instance, it just looks like a TCP IP packet to the network. Network has no clue that we're doing ILA. So all of the optimizations, offloads for TCP, they just work. Um, and also has the advantage, no MTU issues, uh, checksum issue, uh, no issues with UDP checksum and tunneling, no tunneling issues. So um, we like it for that reason. Another advantage, and this is more of a comparison, I guess, with ILNP, is that ILA does not require any changes to the transport layer. As I mentioned, the checksum neutral even prevents or avoids having to do deep packet inspection to update checksums within the packet. Applications, DNS, they only see these externally visible representations of addresses. Uh, we also have open source implementation. This has been in Linux for a while. Uh, we are developing an ILA router. Um, last IETF, we did one in VPP, uh, which is quite successful. And um, we're actually looking at XVP, which is a, a type of um, kind of quasi offload in Linux that really optimizes the data path for things like routing. Next slide. So ILA is not without challenges. Um, one of the big ones is ICMP and the effects of, of on it. So the problem is when a translation is done, say in the network, the destination address is now not the same as what the source originally sent. And the problem is if that subsequently causes an ICMP error, and that goes back to directly to the source, then the source gets a packet with an ICMP error with a destination address that it actually didn't send to. And if the source doesn't support ILA, it would have no clue what this destination address sent to. So in the worst case scenario, it would probably um, ignore the ICMP error. And if it was IC, or, um, path MTU discovery, it would just fall back to um, other mechanisms. There's two mitigations to this. So one is if the source host is ILA aware, it can actually attempt to do the reverse translation and recover the original destination address. If it's not, then we can do kind of a, a similar trick as in NAT and try to arrange it so that there's, on the return path of the ICMP error, it hits an ILA router, which can actually parse the ICMP error and figure out that it was to a destination, an, an ILA destination, and then reverse translate the destination address in the ICMP error message before sending back to the host. So the other um, major issue is multicast. This is kind of, of tricky. So presumably ILA modifies the destination address uh, to do its work. Obviously in IP multicast, that's not really uh, possible. We would have to modify the source address. This creates havoc uh, because now, if, especially if we're sending to a non-ILA host or source from a non-ILA host, the source address could be completely different than, than what it thought it, it was thought. So I don't really have a, a good answer right now to multicast other than to say it's probably not something that, that we would need to support. So right now we're just assuming that ILA and multicast are um, orthogonal. If you need multicast, use uh, an encapsulation technique might be the best advice. Next slide. So the status, um, we are asking into area to take this up as a working group item. As I mentioned at Facebook, we are deploying this um, for task virtualization in our data centers. We, uh, so the first instantiation of that really is focusing on uh, the host side functionality. Um, as I mentioned, as long as it's small scale, we can push all the mappings. But we also, in parallel, are, are developing ILA router and there's uh, a lot of issues with that, so that's where we get into discussions about the broader control plane. Uh, ideas might have some input there. We are looking at maybe using BGP as kind of an initial way to bootstrap this. Um, I don't want to say BGP doesn't scale, but uh, <laughs> we love BGP, we love DNS. Um, so we'll see if it scales. Uh, if it does, that's great. And we're also looking at the uh, resolution reader protocol for ILA host that I mentioned, and we'll uh, be participating in ideas to uh, hopefully get uh, get to this super scalable 
mapping system that can be applied to ILA and the, the other sort of um, solutions. Next slide. Uh, so thinking a little bit about how ILA interacts with LISP, um, I'm kind of thinking maybe it can be complementary. Um, there are things that ILA, in a sense, can't do that LISP couldn't. For instance, we're not going to concern ourselves with IPv4 support, IPv4 support with ILA. Um, Facebook's uh, nice because we have an IPv6 network, so it really was a no-brainer. But thinking about the larger, larger world, um, it really would be hard to try to convert this to an IPv4 solution. So in that case, I would say LISP probably um, would be a, a more general solution in a sense. The control plane also seems like something that should be common. So um, definitely the, the ideas is compelling. Uh, we'll also look and figure out um, how the LISP's control plane either may be leveraged or uh, we can learn from that. So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we're here is, is to, um, we're asking for ideas and input. Uh, fundamentally, it is a form of identifier separator or identifier locator separation, so it has a lot of the same characteristics. Um, but I mean, there may be subtle differences. What I'm kind of hoping is that for the control plane or the abstraction of the model, those differences are more specific to the, the actual data path implementation. And if we get to the control plane, hopefully we can leverage a lot of kind of common elements. Uh, so that's all I had. Any questions? I have a quick comment, if I may. Since you mentioned that there is a Linux implementation, I assume there is a wiki or something that could, uh, explains how to start playing around with ILA. It would be good if you share on the mailing list somebody could be interested in playing that out. That's a very good point. Um, there was, I believe, a um, LWN article on it. Um, so lot, some Linux patches are noted by people who write about them. So I, I believe there's an um, LWN article. I would take it as an action item to do a, a wiki. Uh, it's a good idea. Excellent. Hi, Tom is Rahi Marbel. Uh, first of all, very interesting work. Um, second, I have a small comment about terminology regarding the uh, checksum adjustment field. Um, there is actually a similar concept in other uh, RFCs in OAMP, TOAMP, and also in NTP, and it's called a checksum complement field. So I suggest to reuse the term. I think that was actually from Fred Baker's RFC on the IPv6 NAT, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. That's, that's pretty much where, where I um, got all this. So from. you're saying there's so, already a conflict in there, terminology. Well, it's ATF, right. <laughs> well, I expect okay. consistency. Okay, but I'll, I'll note that. Um, and if, um, if you can point me to some of those RFCs, sure. that, that would yeah. be great. It's, it's a great idea. I mean, I, I don't claim that it's original at all, but it actually was a huge win uh, for ILA in that area. Okay, thanks. Hi, this is Diego. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Four comments. Um, first one, a clarification on terminology. Um, do you agree that you shouldn't call it a sir address and call it a sir prefix? Because in both a sir prefix and a translated address, the um, lower to 64 bits is the same modulo the type in checksum adjust field. You want to comment on that? So actually, we clarified this in the latest version of the draft. A okay. sir prefix is 64 bit prefix that would be up in the upper 64 bits. A sir address is a sir prefix plus an identifier. Got it. A locator is the 64-bit um, high order bits. High order bits yeah. that are a locator. An ILA address is a locator plus identifier. So, does the ILA address and the sir address have the same order 64 bits modulo the type in checksum? Yes. Okay. Good. Right. Good. There, that lower 64 bits is always the identifier. Modular okay, so my second comment is I think ILA is really great because it's good to get away from encapsulation. I think there can be a lot of synergy here. Um, I like the data plane because it's really um, clean. Um, encapsulating IPv6 and IPv6 is the worst overhead combination of everything you can encapsulate. So if we can get rid of that outer header, that's v6 and translate, it's, it's great. Um, what I don't like um, is the control plane that you have right at the moment, the ICMP stuff. ICMP gets filtered so much and gets spoofed, and there's 
um, implosion attacks that can happen. So I, I don't think that should be used to pop because so that's the current mechanism you have right not now. Not actually to, ICMP. We were using UDP. Okay. Um, well, the, yeah, ICMP is a little. No, it, it doesn't matter. Messy. Anything that's reactive, ICMP or the redirects are subject to attacks. But that's just your current way of populating your locator cache. Of course, what you could do is when the source doesn't have anything in its locator ca cache, it could send a map request to a list mapping system and get the information returned, and you could populate the cache that way. That would be a pull-based model where you alluded to there's a possible push-based model that you could use with BGP. And actually, tomorrow my presentation will show how SIR prefixes could be put in the mapping database and how it could return locator addresses. I, I'll show that tomorrow in ideas. Um, oh, my last comment was um, I think we can figure out how to get multicast to work. So that's just some hard thinking. But more to the point is if we want to do IPv4 in this system and IPv6, um, it looks like we're setting a new precedent where there might be multiple data planes um, in one system to support these different features. But, however, with a common control plane, which is good. Um, so th what I'm having to, what I was thinking was, is if you needed um, to have, if you had an IPv4 core and you wanted to send IPv6 over that IPv4 core, you would using a Lisp encapsulation at that point. But if you knew you were talking to an IPv6 system and you knew you had a dual stack core, then you can use ILA translation to send things. So that all is kind of pretty modulo. Do you really want to have multiple data planes for different types of features? We could talk about that later. But then you threw up the multicast slide and said, oh, now I want to do it. So, so there, what we were talking about is the host really wants to do IPv6, but it doesn't know what the underlay is supporting. And if it supports one thing, you use ILA. If it supports v, another thing, it uses encapsulation. But now when we want to use IPv6 multicast, um, you can't, according to your current design, you can't do it. So now do we do it? over v6 and have to do v6 encapsulation for multicast or do we do it with v4 over so those things need to be um explored but um i'm hoping that if you want to have a v6 solution where you have a v6 underlay that it could work for both multicast and unicast so so honestly i haven't thought too much about the multicast um it, it's multicast right so you know a lot of data centers don't use it so it wasn't our first priority right right understand um, but i would agree with that and in terms of having more than one solution you know we'll have the, the discussion today at nvo3 so it's not that's not particularly unprecedented can having one control plane to, to support them is really interesting and one thing i'm hoping we get out of this control plane is that the control plane could tell us how to do it or what the encapsulation parameters are yeah, what the we have, parameters we have are proposals, that would be cool. we have proposals to do that the big question is is do you want the source to head and replicate and which means for every replication you tr you have to translate because you may be going out different interfaces with different provider locator addresses because if native multicast is running in the core you have to get rpf to work in the core and so that's a little bit complicated. So what, what we do is with encapsulation is if you send it out an AT&T network, the outer header has a source address that's out of the PA space of AT&T if you send it out Verizon. So we'd have to change, you'd have to have multiple locator addresses for this. You have to know what interfaces, but let's take all this offline and we can figure it out. Yeah, I think so. Um, Fabio Maina. Um, so can you go back to slide number two or three, the one that was showing the day in the life of the packet? <laughs> yeah. That's this one. So just trying to understand the role of, uh, of the ALA router there, right? So basically, the source is sending the packet to the ALA router because it doesn't have the mapping. That's the reason uh, why you are doing that, right? So you are basically encapsulating to the ALA router, and then the ALA router knows the mapping in some way and will uh, rewrite uh, the uh, correct locator and will uh, uh, deliver to, to the final destination. Yeah, so it, it doesn't, so the source might not even be ILA capable. Right. What it's doing is it's sending a packet to this address, and in the network, this will route to an ILA router. It's like a, an anycast sort of address. Right. So as long as there is an ILA router in the path and this packet's hit it, it can do the translation. One thing I, I forgot to mention, though, is that this also supports the model of non-ILA host talking to ILA host. Right. So you just take away that, that dash line, and then we get this is how hosts on the internet, for instance, would talk to a mobile host. If packets would arrive at the gateway to the network, and then they would be translated to the actual uh, locator destination. That's similar in principle to the uh, proxy tunnel router that uh, uh, we have in this, right? So that's uh, the way we do it. And, and I think. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. And I, I think what helps uh, in, in the list of structure is that uh, then you have a very clear separation of uh, um, the control plane and the data plane, right? The PXTR case is kind of uh, mixing it because you don't have capability. So, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's fine. So the other question I had is, um, well, one thing I want to do is second what Dino said about the non-encapsulation uh, identity separation. Uh, I've had a few people saying, uh, Sure, cool, you know, tunnels are cool, tunnels are cool, but uh, um, I think the, the, the concern that some people have expressed are now that we are deploying uh, IPv6 uh, networks, we have a lot of, tool, of tools that uh, can handle with the IPv6 packet, and when we encapsulate, then, you know, we lose visibility on, on what is going on. So I think that is a more... Uh, strong as a requirement than uh, just the fact that, you know, it's a bigger packet. That certainly is another uh, reason. And the last question, uh, did you talk about security, uh, you know, data plane security? Um, yeah. Yes. So this is where an another, um, I guess I should mention this on the, I guess the cons of ILA. It's one thing we can do with encapsulation, say, go, we've gone to great lengths to put in security so we can um, with the, within the encapsulation, we can su secure the headers, we can secure the payload. Uh, I will be presenting an end area today, and actually I'm presenting both GOO, which is generic UDP encapsulation, with ILA. I have a slide that shows the differences between them, and I also think those are kind of complementary. Um, the one place this would really manifest itself as being a problem is if we were doing multi-tenant um, virtualization, in which time if I'm just using ILA, I can do things like uh, network isolation with virtual networking identifiers and basically build overly networks. Problem is without security, if they ever, uh, packets ever get corrupted or cross paths, I may now in fact be sending packets to the completely wrong tenant and that violates a fundamental principle. So in that case, if security, if that level of security is really important to you, again, I, I would say ILA is not the solution encapsulation is so the solution. Encapsulation gives you the ability to add a whole bunch of ancillary data to the packet. You could do the same thing with IPv6 extension headers, but right. somehow I think that's a little bit weaker of a, Can a you, concept at this I'm, point. I'm sorry to cut you, but you. Uh, we're running out of time. I've had, we have two minutes, I guess, for Albert for the light. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tom. Seems I only have two minutes. I think that I will explain the, the the basic idea, and then I will be presenting tomorrow in the ideas meeting, which is tomorrow at six, right? Studio two, where I will have fifteen minutes. So, <laughs> if you are interested, then you can come also and and we'll see the presentation. So, if you can go to slide number seven, I believe. Yeah, this one. So. Here I'm assuming that everybody uh, knows what is blockchain, or I don't have time to, to, to explain. But the main idea that we have here is, so blockchain is a te technology supporting Bitcoin, and beyond Bitcoin controversies, which are out of the scope of this talk, uh, the technology is, is clearly a success, and it has many applications. So here the basic idea is, can we use blockchain to store, uh, and now I'm using this terminology, EID prefix delegations, in a secure way, so it's pretty much the same data that we have right now on the DDT. Not on the map server, but rather on the DDT. So what we want to store is EID to map server information, and then you will have to go to the map server to obtain the, the mapping. Um, uh, so map resolvers use blockchain to obtain where the information is, which is the map server, and then they go to the map server and query for the mapping. And the idea is that blockchain provides a very secure way to store this information. So um, that's how it works. It's, it's quite simple, right? So in, in Bitcoin, you have a wallet of in Bitcoin you have a wallet of coins that you can send to other people to buy things. So you can create transactions. And blockchain, what allows you is to prevent double spending. So it's pretty much the same. Here we have a wallet, and what we have are prefixes. And we we can do is we can delegate prefixes to someone. So we can be the root, and we can delegate some prefix to someone, which is a pretty standard transaction. Um, so this is what a transaction is, delegating a prefix to another entity. And what blockchain is at the end, it's a, a public record of delegations that anyone can verify and make sure that 
this guy is the owner of that DID prefix. And why is the owner of the, that DID? If you go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, the delegation that are on top. So the last owner, how can I verify that this is the real owner of a prefix? Well, because I can work the blockchain, work it back, see who delegated the prefix to that guy, see that there is another delegation, and work to the root, which is the one that I assume I, they have all the prefixes. So that's pretty much, I think that's it's time, right? Yeah, one quick question that yeah. I thought of. Usually blockchains work in terms of you delegate things to one entity. But in Lisp, in the end, this block of addresses, this block of IDs, not addresses, is allocated to a set of ETRs. Have you thought about what it takes to represent that notion in a blockchain? I don't understand the question because here what we're doing is saying this ID prefix is delegated to that map server. And then if you want the, the real mapping, you need to go to the map server. But, so the, the, but the, the real mapping is at the ETR, it's not at the map servers. I know, I know, yeah. As far as I under Job Snyder's, what I understand from this proposal is that it's basically a replacement for the RAR system. Yeah. Part of it is we actually do want to allow it to get delegated to more than one map server. But the basic idea is is there and we can the, we don't have time unfortunately okay. to explore it fully today but it, it's an interesting idea no okay. question about that quick, quick, Dino. Quick, this is quick, quick 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 this is a mechanism where you can remove the ddt roots and ddt nodes and find out who the map servers are that are registering prefixes and they can give you a map referral back and then you can send map requests directly to it and it forwards the map request so it just takes the top part of ddt away that's it yeah this proposal yeah, it's, I'm thinking about things like redundancy. If you have, you, we want to have more than one map server that can answer, you got to have oh, a delegation no, to more than one thing. Do that. So this, actually, this is how it works, Joel. I have but to that's stop awesome. my, my co-chair. From <laughs> we, we are out of time. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But you can continue the discussion tomorrow and offline. So you have uh, two things to keep in mind. Right, ACC, if you want EIDs block temporary and tomorrow this meeting six o'clock studio two ideas okay thank you very much for all of you see you back in chicago i'm sorry Absolutely. Now, I think